Good evening, everyone. It's uh, what a joy it is for me to be here tonight. I have the easiest job of the evening. I just have to introduce four fabulous women and to really say a very, very warm welcome to all of you for coming to our subscriber event. We love these subscriber events on the Australian because it brings us closer to our audience. Um, I say there's events you have to go to and there's events you want to go to. Pat's last night's BCA dinner I would put in the have to go to category. <laughs> Tonight, not so much. <laughs> I get to sit along with you and, uh, and listen to, to my friends and colleagues, as I said, four fabulous women. I could say it about seven times because I have such high regard for all of them. Um, so I'm going to join you in just a minute and listen to Claire Harvey, our editorial director, to Caroline Overington, literary editor, to Janet Albrechtson, the best columnist in Australia, and yes, I am a bit biased, but it's true, <laughs> and Ellie Dudley, who's next gen, and she is, uh, Ellie has taken on the legal affairs round for the Australian, and she is killing it. She is doing such a fantastic job, and uh, so they are gonna talk to you about women in journalism, about politics, about law, about Me Too, about feminism, and a whole bunch of other stuff that's unscripted, and uh, <laughs> let's see where we, where we go. What I would say is that women have worked, we're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year on The Australian, and women have been a part of our newsroom for, from, rather, the very beginning. Um, I'm Editor-in-Chief of The Australian and I've worked on The Australian for 37 years. So I kind of know every nook and cranny and I'm surrounded by a bunch of incredibly talented journalists, including some incredibly talented women. So that's all I've got. Would you please join with me in welcoming Claire, Caroline, Janet and Ellie to the stage. <laughs> Hey. Is there an order? Oh, yes, you're right, yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you very, <laughs> thank you very much for being here. Can you squeeze in? I can. You got it. Thank you. I'm Claire Harvey. I'm the editorial director of the Australian, which mainly means I look after all of our audio, from investigations to our daily news podcast, The Front. Of course, this conversation is going to be in the front at uh, but tomorrow morning. I promise it'll be ready by the time you wake up. Uh, amazing producer Kristen Amiet is at the back of the room pulling that episode together right now. Um, so we have to give her some good content. So um, on that note, we'll have a roving microphone a little later on um, through the room, which you can use to ask questions. Uh, if you don't want to be in the front, um, don't ask a question. <laughs> or uh, you, can, you can scan the QR code that'll be on the screen soon to ask a question that will come to here to me on my phone or on this iPad, and I'll be able to ask it for you. Uh, uh, this will also be recorded for video. So again, if you don't want to be on The Australian tomorrow in the video of this event, then send me your question privately and I'll ask it for you. Um, we're extremely honoured to have you. You are the Australian Plus subscribers, which means you are our, most, uh, you are our VVIPs, the most important people, the people who make it possible for us to do the kind of journalism we do. Great journalism is, uh, is tough, it's scary, it's amazingly great fun and it's really expensive, uh, which of course is why we need people to support us by subscribing, so thank you very much. These events are one very small thing that we can do to thank you for um, being part of our community, part of our family. Uh, and uh, on that note, I'm very glad to introduce some members of our family. Janet Albrechtson, who's our wonderful columnist, who I just found out today has been with us for 21 years. That's right. That's yes. amazing. So tell us, how did you come to... <laughs> <laughs> like a birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah. You don't look a day over 25. <laughs> so how did you come to The Australian? Why did you come to The Australian? Why did I come to The Australian? Um, uh, so many things in life are just luck and, uh, and circumstance, and it was certainly one of those things where I had just finished doing a doctorate in law. I was at home with children. I'd been working at a law firm, didn't want to be working, you know, 80 hours a week uh, while I was having children. So after I did a doctorate, I thought, well, what do I do now? Um, and ended up writing a couple of really boring, very, very dry commercial pieces. 
And from that segued over to The Australian. And Tom Switzer was the opinion editor at the time. And uh, he invited me to take up a column when Frank Devine left, which was an incredible honour to step into those shoes. And I thought to him, I, I think, I'm sure I said to Tom, I don't think I'll have anything to say, like every week. <laughs> <laughs> and then 9-11 happened and there was just so much to say. <laughs> and it's never really stopped, has it? So, no, it yeah, really hasn't. Yeah. Caroline was already a story journalist by the time she came to The Australian. She had worked uh, across the Australian media from the, the very smallest publications to the very biggest. Um, she'd been a foreign correspondent. And when you came to the Australian, Caroline, you very quickly started breaking quite remarkable stories about the Australian wheat board scandal. Um, tell us how you um, came on to that story and, and, and kind of what it meant for your career. Well, actually, I had been working in New York and that was where the Oil for Food program uh, story first broke. And I was in New York for Fairfax because you're right, I've worked for the Sydney Morning Herald for The Age, I've made documentaries for Channel 7, I spent five years working for the Australian Women's Weekly and it was so much fun. And actually I ended up back at the Australian from the Women's Weekly, that was the job that I had before. But the wheat board story was probably the biggest of my career and it started when I was in New York, New York being the home of the United Nations. The United Nations ran the Oil for Food program and that's where the, fir the first uh, whispers of scandal bubbled to the surface. Yeah, How's your friendship with John Howard going? <laughs> you know, it was kind of interesting because when I was working on the wheat board story, of course the Howard government was in power and Alexander Downer was the foreign minister. And there's always been this uh, feeling that, you know, the Australian wouldn't take a position that would be against the Conservative government. And I had just started working at the Australian, so I didn't know. But that wasn't the case. <laughs> you know, that, was not, that was not the case at all. Like it was that. People just said to me, you know, go out there, find the story, tell us what happened, go out there, do your reporting. Nobody tried to tell me to do it this way or do it that way. I thought that was fantastic. So sometimes people say to me, oh, do they tell you what to write? I'm like, no, like that, mm. that never happened at all. Mm. Ellie Dudley is the Australian's, I think, youngest ever legal affairs correspondent, and she is absolutely <laughs> smashing that round. Yeah, Every yeah. day, Ellie is breaking unbelievable yarns from, uh, from previously obscure cases in the family court to cases that really make us question the fundamentals of our justice system. Mm -hmm. um, and, but Ellie, it seems like about five minutes ago that you were, uh, you were starting your cadetship at The Australian. <laughs> How have you gone from being a university student starting your career to, I think, the preeminent legal affairs correspondent in Australia? Oh, um well, I started as a, as a cadet at the end of 2020, um, and so we kicked off pretty quickly from that into the Delta lockdown in New South Wales. So I sat on the Australian's live blog, blogging the COVID cases every morning. I sat there waiting for Gladys to come up on the screen and went, 16 cases have been <laughs> in New South Wales. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think that was a great training ground. You know, yeah. I sat on that blog for so long, and it really cleans up your copy um, in order to, to send that off, and then all of a sudden it's on the Australian's website, and you've got your dad texting you, being like, oh, Elliot, the top the home page. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, and then I, I took on the legal affairs round. So look, the Australian, I think, and, and the cadetship that um, they, 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 they put us through um, was such a fabulous training ground, getting really stuck into what was at the time, you know, the, the biggest story for a year, um, to then be like, okay, well, I'm going to try and do something different. Um, legal affairs seems like a fun round. I um, asked Michelle if I could do it. She said, all right, and, um, and that's where <laughs> I am now. So, yeah, it's been really, really fun. You've started a legal affairs newsletter, Ipso Facto, which mm. is, uh, you know, this is part of the thinking that young people have brought to journalism. Um, we've had newsletters for ages where we send out an email to people sort of telling them about what we've got and, you know, please, you know, click on some of these stories if you like. And, you know, um, and we've always been a bit tentative about it, I think. Ellie breaks an amazing yarn in the newsletter every time <laughs> she sends one out and it, it has turned into a, a huge um, audience, a, a, a huge new way for us to reach new members of our audience who are keen for that kind of content. So, um, yeah, congratulations. You are a I worry star. that we'll lose her to a law firm. Yeah. They won't even yeah. know that she doesn't have a law degree. No, 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 no that's <laughs> true. <laughs> I've been worrying about losing her to the Sydney Morning Herald. I know, I worry, <laughs> I worry about law firms. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking... Losing yeah, yeah, okay, no, we're not going to lose Let's her. Let's just pay for... Yeah. 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 The bench or nothing. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know whether this has just been because I've been watching the Moira Deeming versus John Pesuto defamation trial for the past two days. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are keen on the Federal Court's YouTube channel, but I'm a big fan. <laughs> and so 
As you may know, Moira Deeming, who is a Victorian member of the Upper House, is suing the Victorian Liberal leader, John Fasuto, for defamation because she, she's very vocally pro-women's rights, pro-women's spaces. She appeared at a rally uh, where some neo-Nazis showed up. Uh, the Liberal leader sacked her from the party saying that she was associating with the wrong kind of people. She's now suing him for defamation. But it has really made me think that it's not that long ago that this issue women's rights, women's spaces, trans rights, gender diversity, was kind of all we were talking about um, before we got obsessed with Israel and Gaza. So I thought I might ask you, Janet, a very 2022 question. <laughs> what is a woman? Well, yes. <laughs> Isn't it sad that we, uh, we, we ask that question at all and that, and that people uh, fumble the answer? I'm not, I'm not going to answer it because we know what a woman is. Um, it, it's, just, it's just become so silly. But... Constantly, we see the word woman expunged. We see breast, uh, we see breast feeders or chest feeders, and the language around uh, that's being used to get rid of woman is, I, I think, so detrimental to women. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with someone like Maura Deming supporting that. Um, that's the problem, though, isn't it? When you turn up to those events, that rat bags turn up. They try to uh, to destroy what's going on, and the neo Nazis will do that all the time. It happens everywhere. You know, you can't pick and choose who you appear with. You just have to stay true to what you believe in. And I think that she was absolutely entitled to do that. The Liberal Party in Melbourne is a a curious creature um, that it feels uncomfortable with those issues. Um, but you know, I, it, as you say, it, it was one of those issues that we were talking about so much. Yeah. a couple of years ago. But it hasn't gone away. I, I look at what J.K. Rowling has done. In many ways, I think that her most important work has been how she has responded and confronted and challenged um, the more radical parts of the trans movement, as much as we love the Harry Potter books. She really has been at the forefront of doing that and giving cover to a lot of people who wanted to raise their hands and uh, say, well, we know what a woman is and we won't have any of this expunging the word woman from our language. Caroline, you cover the world of uh, the literary world and the world of books. How did J.K. Rowling avoid being cancelled? Oh, well, I'm not sure that she hasn't been entirely cancelled. There are certainly... I know that some of the actors who appeared in her films no longer have anything to do with her, and many people say that they no longer read the books. So I'm not quite sure that she hasn't been cancelled, at least at the margins. I mean, I think what's really interesting about J.K. Rowling is that she was herself the victim of domestic violence, or, or male violence. She was in a relationship with somebody who was violent towards her. There's no doubt about that. That was a matter of, um, of police attention. And so she has always in her private life funded um, refuges for women who are escaping domestic violence. And she wanted to keep those spaces free of men. But it's become difficult to do because as we've seen in various court cases, um, if men decide that they want to enter women's spaces and vice versa, uh, those those barriers are now falling, and we've seen it. We've seen it both ways. We've seen uh, men wanting to swim in female-only pools, and we've seen women wanting to enter um, men's-only clubs. Um, what she was saying is, I want to fund spaces that where women who are escaping violence can feel safe. And she was told that through various avenues that 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 was not possible. That men would be welcome in these spaces, and that was how she became involved in the whole. Uh, drama, but it ha it has. Um, I, I think it's heartening in a way that women are now such full citizens of democracy that they are often at the forefront now of these freedom movements, if you will, because it was also Lionel Shriver, the writer, who was at the front of the campaign to say that people should be able to write whatever books they like, mm -hmm. regardless of whether they're staying in their lane. You might remember that she turned up in Brisbane. Um, controversially wearing a sombrero on her head. And she said, if I want to write a Mexican character, I will. If I want to write a disabled character, I will. If I want to pretend that I'm gay or trans or whatever, I will, because I'm a, a writer and I'm a creator and I'm entitled to tell the stories that I want to tell. And you, as the audience, will judge me. You will decide whether or not I'm any good. You very rarely see men entering this space. They seem to be a little shy when it comes to standing up 
for some of these issues, which are basically about censorship. What's been your perspective on that, Ellie? You're part of a generation who are putting, you know, their pronouns on their email signatures. Mm. Uh, they are uh, very open to the notion that trans people are vulnerable and that they have been excluded from society and that this is an opportunity to give them some rights and some recognition. Um, you, and yet every day you are covering the law where things tend to be a little bit more black and white. Mm. How's that? What's your take on all of that, um, especially coming from the generation that you do? Well, I think it's just become normal now. It's, it's ju that's just the expectation. The expectation is that you've got your pronouns in your um, email signature and that um, you would be, you know, of course, um, welcoming and accepting to, to anybody from any walks of life, as, as you should be anyway. Um, I cover the law, um, as, as previously mentioned. I've spent a lot of time in family court uh, watching cases uh, between fathers and, um, and mothers fighting over whether or not their young children should be prescribed puberty blockers. Um, you know, instances where parents um, may have transitioned um, and the impact that they may have had on their child. Um, it's incredibly complex. Um, the law, as you mentioned, is black and white, but it seems like these cases are so grey, and yet when they're entering these spaces, you can see these judges sitting behind the bench thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to possibly deal with this and, and how can we bring justice and how, in family court cases, how are we going to find what's best for this child? It's incredibly difficult. Mm. One of the cases that you've been, uh, one of the, the issues that you've been covering, and, and so has Janet, has been the, the debate in New South Wales about uh, whether um, sexual assault prosecutions are being brought forward when they should not be, mm. uh, whether the, um, the inclination to believe all women has uh, inadvertently or otherwise resulted in prosecutions of people where there is no chance of a conviction. Um, how has it been covering that issue, given that you have faced some really serious pushback from the Office of the New South Wales DPP? I'm talking to both of you here. Mm -hmm. um, it's been incredibly challenging. Well, look, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting story, right? For those who haven't been reading along, there's been five judges in New South Wales that have criticised the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions for running so-called um, meritless rape cases. Um, some of those uh, judgments, they've, they've written them in, in cost judgments, some of them have been incredibly critical. Um, two of them have been brought before the Judicial Commission. Um, one of them, one of the judges has been uh, seriously reprimanded for making the comments that he did and, and um, Sally Dowling, the Director of Public Prosecutions, has been somewhat vindicated in that. Um, and and it's, it's an incredibly difficult story um, because it's not good for anyone, right? You, you look at it and you think, this can't be good for if, if an, uh, an innocent person is being put through the trauma of a trial, um, you know, having their name dragged through the media in some cases. At the same time, it's also not good for a, a complainant um, if there is uh, a woman who's being promised that her case is um, going to get a conviction and she's going to have justice brought um, to put her through the trauma of trial, even if, you know, she's telling the truth and um, she could get to the point where um, she's getting... Um, uh, that, yeah, she has to sit through a trial like that. Um, it's been an incredibly challenging story um, and it's, it's, you know, one that I think that we're going to see continue played out as we discuss our sexual assault prosecutions um, across the country. Janet, I'm interested in your take on this idea that um, I wonder if there's a, a tendency in the law or in the DPP's office, not just here but around the country, to, you know, oh, we don't really know, let's give it to a jury to decide yeah. or let's give it to a judge. Yeah. Do you think that's happening? And, and if so, what's the issue with that? I, I do think that's happening. I think, as with so many things, the pendulum swings. Um, so we went from an era where not enough cases were being brought um, before the courts to an era, the current era, where I think inappropriate cases are being brought for that very reason... That, well, for a number of reasons, but one of them is that um, that prosecutors would rather not make the call, they would rather leave it to a jury, which means that a lot of these cases in many jurisdictions across Australia, if you are charged with sexual assault, um, you will be waiting for a trial for over a year, uh, your life will be on hold, um, we should have people charged for sexual assault where there is sufficient evidence and those cases should move very swiftly through the courts and get decided. But we have case, we have judicial system which is completely clogged up 
And it's the interesting thing about the five cases that Ellie has done such stellar reporting on is that it really has to be only the tip of the iceberg because in New South Wales, we've heard about it through what these are called cost applications. Mm. In the ACT, for example, there is no means of having a cost application if there is a not guilty verdict. You can't go and ask for uh, reimbursement of your legal costs and therefore we don't hear from judges on what they really think about that particular case and uh, whether a defendant should be reimbursed and why. In these cases, the defendants were reimbursed with mm. scathing comments from judges saying that these cases never should have reached the court. I know from speaking to prosecutors in other offices across the country that once an accused person has been charged, it is much easier to just allow it to go to court than to actually jump through the hoops that, that, that are required to discontinue a case that it's very difficult to discontinue a case. And it shouldn't be, because if the evidence does not support going to court, you are doing a great disservice to the defendant, to the complainant, as Ellie said, to the court system, um, and I, I think just to the whole community, because you're letting, uh, you're letting everyone down. What's your take, Caroline, uh, as I, a proud feminist? Um, I, I, I might be putting a word in your mouth there, but on what's happened to the Me Too movement in Australia and how issues like this uh, influence our thinking about um, what has changed in Australian society. I guess one of the things I'm interested in is who is welcome in the Me Too movement, um, particularly in the area where, where I work, um, covering books and, and the ideas that come out of books. It seems to me that the older style feminist that we knew in the 1970s your Germaine Greer-style characters aren't welcome in the modern Me Too movement. It used to be um, a movement that was seen um, promoting the rights of women and promoting their right to do things, for example, like not get married and not have children, pursue their careers, be welcome in the workplace, not be sexually harassed, that kind of thing. Whereas now it seems to be about something else entirely. And I know that a lot of um, women who were part of that movement in the 1970s don't feel very welcome in what I guess we would describe as third stage feminism. If, if the, what we saw in the 1900s suffrage was first stage and in the 1970s the second stage, then this is definitely the third stage of feminism. And I think that, that many women aren't quite sure how they fit in to what has become um, a fringe movement, I think, rather than a movement that is designed to bring all of us together. Mm. Ellie and I have been talking a lot in the office about wellness, um, inspired by Elle McPherson's contribution to the conversation about cancer recently. Um, and I think that this flows from what we're talking about here, Ellie, with uh, you know, the idea... I'm interested in this idea that, um, you know, when you're selling a book to women or you, um, you run a company which is selling supplements to women, mm. that you, you might talk about your own, um, your own ability to heal, heal your cancer. Mm. What's your take on the whole kind of wellness industry <laughs> as it relates to women? Um, well, people love it. Women love it, right? Mm. You know, um, crystals... Um, I, I don't, you know, 75% of my friends have CoStar, the, the app, the astrology app on their phone that they get little prompts in the morning telling them what their day is going to look like. Oh. You just have to watch Channel 7 to get your horoscope. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I think it's all part of a search for meaning, frankly. I, I think that it's, it's part of a search for, I, I think that, you know, a horoscope can come up and you say, oh, I don't really agree with that one, I'm going to ignore it today. Or you say, oh, no, I'm interested in that one, I'm going to follow that one today. Um, and I think it's all about a, a big search for meaning and a big search for um, an ideal life. And I, I think that women are really drawn to that. But it's also a search for money. Like, that too. Like it's just an <laughs> enormous industry. Well, that's right. Where I think the, that yeah, women in yeah. a sense get sucked into where women feel insecure about how they look, what they should be doing, how they should be feeling, blah, blah, blah. You know, pregnancy, menopause, all of it. Mm, uh, yeah. I, I, I think it's very much directed at women's insecurities, and for that reason, I'm a yeah. bit down on the world. I like, well, I don't like crystals, I like a bit of yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. But I, I, I think it's just a shockingly commercialised Do we put industry. yoga in the wellness industry, though, or do we put that in, you know, a sort of fitness 
industry because oh, when crosses I think, over. Yeah, so it does, <laughs> yeah. to the travel yeah. section. Yeah, yeah, okay, Bali. right. Yeah. And Bali. <laughs> Bali. <laughs> Bali. Yeah. No, I think that's true. I mean, it it, it does uh, seem to me it's no no accident that one of the biggest companies or the growth of the biggest one of the biggest companies we've seen in recent years has been the makers of Azempic. That is absolutely aimed at women, and there are so many women who are taking fat loss drugs, not because they're obese, just because they want to drop a few pounds by Christmas. And, it, and it's interesting to me how commercialised that has become. Definitely there is a market out there for that, uh, for, for making women feel bad. There always has mm, been. Mm. And um, the problem with Elle's contribution, I, I, I think that Elle McPherson has a right to say, this is what I chose to do for my own yes. cancer treatment. The problem is that she had something to sell. That that's the drama. Mm. Like because you're part of the wellness company that is trying to flog wellness products to women who actually might need cancer treatment. That was the problem. And the other problem is that she didn't and she chose what you know, what to focus on in her various interviews and many interviews. And the focus was on her dental, herbal, spiritual, uh, you know, way of dealing with cancer rather than the two lumpectomies that she had had. Right. <laughs> and it's quite possible that there was a lumpectomies that saved that her. Saved but, her you know, life. she wanted yeah. to believe that it was... And, and I feel for women who would listen to that and think, I might, I might try that. I'm worried about surgery or I can't afford it. I can't, you know, as, uh, as one of our beautiful young journalists wrote um, in, in the paper last week, mm. uh, what if you're a, a mother who can't afford to take a huge amount of time off to have surgery and all of those things. What if like, she thinks that she can just take these alternative treatments to get well? Between you and me, they're not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> they're not cheap. Yeah. I think Elle's things are not yeah, cheap, yeah. are they? Well, that's a special Arizona clinic. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, I mean, I, read, I heard this morning that um, Khloe Kardashian's new business is selling a kind of vitamin, a supplement, which is uh, a, a, a meant to be an Ozempic, have the same results as Ozempic. And, of course, it's probably sawdust and some food colouring mm, and mm, a bit of sugar. Mm, mm. Uh, but this is the thing, this is the difference between wellness and Ozempic, right? Mm. Wellness products, like, they don't really work. Ozempic works. Mm. Absolutely it works. And as women, how, do, how should we I mean, be thinking about debate, Ozempic? Yeah, you there's know? a whole debate to be had about whether it should just be made available to everybody who wants it. Because if you ask people do they want to drop a dress size by Christmas, most people would say yes. They absolutely tor torture themselves to get there. The diet industry is the size it is because losing weight is something many people in the West want to do. At the moment, it's being offered to mainly celebrities and people. People are getting it in a roundabout way. Mm. They're getting it mm. from kind of dodgy doctors. They're getting compa compounds that are made in backyard chemists. They are taking it. There is an argument that if it does work and if you can prove that it's safe, should everybody be allowed to have access to it? I, I think that's something that we will see in the next year or so. It's already, I think, the biggest drug in the world. The company is the biggest company in the country that makes it. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised to see it become bigger still. Is it OK to want to be thin? <laughs> sure. Isn't well, it? I think that today's Ozempic is yesterday's skinny me tea, right? And yes. <laughs> the day before that was the juice cleanse and Beyonce did her thing. And, and none yeah. of this is new, right? It just so happens that um, particularly with Ozempic, we've got social media now that has that sort of thing, you know, churning its way, not just through uh, middle-aged women who want to drop a dress size, but younger people as well who, you know, have shocking mental health, have shocking body image, have no idea, um, you know, uh, what to do with themselves. I think that, that none of it's none of it's new, and I think that there's always going to be um, a, a, a desire to to drop a dress size amongst some areas of the population. Mm. Of course, it will. It really makes me wonder what happened to the body positive movement, and you know, love the skin you're in, and you know, and and I don't want to. I, I know I told you I've been watching the federal court YouTube stream for two, for two days, so <laughs> I may, and maybe I'm just a bit obsessed now about the kind of women's rights and trans debate. But that was my question too about trans, um, the, the, the advice that we give to children who are questioning their gender identity, um, is the advice that we should give them, um, you are perfect just the way you are, or is it, would you like surgery? So, you know, how do we approach that as kind of women, uh, you know, who, who have been through this ourselves mm. of the skinny tea and the, you mm. know, worrying about the dress sizes? Mm. Yeah. I think it's something that we... Um, I, I don't have kids, so I'll, I'll let you guys come at it from that, <laughs> that area. But I think that it's something that um, to have a child be able to d determine that 
you know, for themselves and, and to ensure that they're not being affected by the culture that they're in is probably the way. Look, I was a shocking parent. I wouldn't let them, have, you know, pierce <laughs> their ears, so. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> were you the no, soft touch? No tattoos. No, no tattoos. No ta you no, oh, no, you were the tough one. No tattoos, yeah, yeah. no pierced ears. Now they've got pierced ears and a few of them have tattoos, so, yeah, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so I have no control. But it's, a ter it's, it's such a fraud issue, isn't it? Um, the problem is, I think, that the medical profession in this particular area has edged out parental influence and responsibility to the point where parents feel completely disempowered to, uh, to know their own children and to push back and suggest, could it possibly be that we need to explore this other issue? Um, once the trans issue takes hold, I think that then becomes a, a one-way street. And I think in any area of health, that, that is a dangerous, mm. uh, a dangerous thing for us to do. What's your take on that, Caroline? You got I think four, adults I think are different. Ad I think adults should be able to do whatever they like. I do remember speaking to Kate McGregor, who in a in a previous life with Malcolm McGregor, when she was transitioning, we did a um, a piece with her in Women's Weekly, and she said um, that had she not transitioned to become Catherine, the alternative was that she would die. Mm. That she was in such turmoil and such trauma and such stress. An absolutely brilliant woman. She really is a brilliant woman. Um, she thinks very seriously about all kinds of things, um, political philosophy and, and Christian philosophy and, and, and military actions and so on. Of course, she was in the army for a long time. And it was impossible not to be moved by her story. I think adults are very different. Um, with children, I, I, I would not be in favour of children transitioning um, at very young ages. And I, I think that most people that I speak to are in that camp. Children who are 11 and 12 years old transitioning, um, it's not a bad idea for society to pause and think a little uh, cautiously before we do particularly any surgical interventions there. What about the heat that that issue has generated? And, um, you know, uh, all of us cop heat all the time for anything we write or say in the public domain. I, I know I do. That's why I'm not on social media anymore, because mm. I just can't handle it. Um, I know you do, Janet. I, I know we all do. Um, you know, that issue is so hot, and I think some people are hesitant to enter the debate because it's so hot. Why is that? Why is it? Why can't we have a conversation about this? What do you think, Janet? Because the, uh, I think it's been pitched as a, a life or death issue, and, and that, that's a very serious thing. Um, so if you are raising questions about trans rights, you are, you are basically then portrayed as someone who is happy to endanger the life of young children. Um, and when, when any debate is pitched in those terms, it makes it very, very hard uh, to have a reasoned debate. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it, that in Australia we haven't yet caught up with what's happened in the United Kingdom, <laughs> um, that we, there are still blinkers on in certain parts of our uh, medical profession on the trans front. And I find that just astounding. I mean, we look, we look to doctors to, to do no harm um, and we are jumping into this experiment and I don't think there's any other word for it when we are doing it so quickly um, with, uh, yeah, as Caroline says, not pausing. Um, Caroline, one of the things that's happened since the Black Lives Matter movement is that uh, the people who run prizes or awards have really had a look at are we doing this right? Are we, you know, uh, we, we don't want to be the next Oscars so white, you know. <laughs> Are we reflecting um, society's diversity well enough? In um, the arts and culture space in which you work, um, what are you seeing in terms of the way decisions are made about what works are commissioned, who gets greenlit, who wins awards? What are you seeing there? There is much more diversity than there used to be. In fact, I, I get um, regular complaints um, from one particular reader who, who looks at prize lists and has said that I think nine of the last 10 Miles Franklins, which is the major literary award for Australians, have been won by women. And there is now a prize specifically for women called the Stella Prize. And that the shortlists tend to be dominated by women. The Booker shortlist was released earlier this week and five of the six names on the list are women. And they say that men are finding it more difficult to be published and that is absolutely true. Um, if you talk to the publishing industry, about 80% of books published last year were by women. The other side of that argument is that most people who buy books are also women. And so it becomes very chicken and egg. Are, are publishing houses catering to what people want by 
by publishing more women. So some of the biggest authors in Australia now are Leanne Moriarty and Jane Harper. They sell in their tens of thousands and they mostly sell to women. Um, interestingly, what also sells to women is soft porn. Like they <laughs> I was about to say, what do women want? Like the big, yeah, yeah, like what do, what do women want? They basically want, I mean, for a long time there, or for the past 10 years, they've really liked true crime. Like true crime in podcasts and in books have been flying off the shelves, and it's mainly to women who love it. But at the moment, the big um, thing is what we call romanticy, which is like a mix of romance. So about 10 years ago, everybody in the world still one of the biggest books ever sold in the hundreds of millions of copies, Fifty Shades of Grey. And if you don't know, the, the, the storyline is basically a billionaire, because who doesn't want one of those? <laughs> a billionaire. A, a young woman comes in to interview him. She's a young journalist, funnily enough. She comes in to interview him and he seduces her and then he takes her back to his mansion and he has a red room of pain and she opens the door and it's all handcuffs and cat and eye tiles hanging up there. And they came out in three volumes and they sold hundreds of millions of copies. And the publishing industry was quite surprised. Who's reading this? And it was women. Women in their tens of thousands were reading soft porn. Um, didn't surprise anyone like me who was old enough to remember the story of O, which was also sold, you know, huge numbers. And but Lady Chatterley's Lover. Yeah, yeah. And well, yeah, absolutely, going even further back. But uh, now the big thing is romanticy. So if you go into Demick's Bookshop, which is still the most beautiful bookshop in Sydney, mm. um, and the true crime and crime aisle is now empty. There's no one in it. And romanticy <laughs> is packed. You can't get near it. And it's... Romanticy. I haven't romanticy. Heard of it. It's a mix of romance and, and fantasy. Right. So it's sex with dragons. Gee. Gee. Right. <laughs> Like, I, need, I need to all catch these, up. Well, yeah, all these like <laughs> dragons who are, who are enormous, <laughs> like they're enormous, <laughs> and they have these long tongues and these huge teeth and they salivate everywhere. And these damsels who actually don't need rescuing because they've got like bows and arrows and things and they like shoot. But it's like yeah, romant <laughs> uh, this kind of mix is kind of selling like crazy. <laughs> so it's sort of interesting to sort of note that yes, the book industry is totally feminised now almost completely feminised. Almost all books sold in Australia are either by women or for women. But it's hard to unpack whether or not that is, you know, what came first. The other thing that's interesting too that one publisher said to me was, yes, um, men, ha women have won all the prizes for the last five or ten years. But if you stretch it out over the last hundred years, men have still won 80% of them. So it, it guess it depends very much on the timeline that you're looking at. Mm. Uh, and the, the just going back to Fifty Shades of Grey for a minute. Yeah, um, why not? Please. <laughs> you know, no, 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 what happens? She marries him. Oh. I know, it's like so conventional. So it's so conservative a story. So and, in fact, and then there are no more visits to the room of pain. You know, and I, yeah, no, they are, but over. there's children in oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Caroline. <laughs> and then the pain becomes changing nappies. It's a sleep stuff. deprivation. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I remember my son came back from a holiday when he was oh, so little, when he came home and he, with, with a friend uh, to Fiji or something, he came home and he said, Mum, all of the women were sitting around the pool reading the same book. It was very, very strange. Yeah. I said, oh, what yeah. book was that? Oh, something called 50. 50 something. Oh, yeah. 50 yeah. 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 Well, the, the sequel to that, well, not, you know, not, not the, the, the literal sequel, but a, a book that became massive after that and then became the biggest Netflix show ever was 365 Days, which is about kind of getting raped. Like, why are women fantasising about getting flogged and getting raped? Do you know what? That's so interesting because Gillian Anderson, who you all know from the... Sex Education. N no! Oh, shit. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the X-Files. From the X-Files. Oh, okay. That's Some people are so young. From the X-Files. She was with David Duchovny. I remember they had that little thing going on, where they weren't they, where they weren't they. Anyway, um, she this week or last week released a book of sexual fantasies which is supposed to take into account all the changes that we've seen in society. So mm -hmm. it's updating basically the old Nancy Friday sex therapy thing. So she basically outsourced the whole book. I should do this, actually. She just asked everyone else to write the chapters. <laughs> what are your sexual fantasies? And one of the really interesting things about that book, well, two things are interesting. Firstly, one of my male reviewers, one of my male literary critics, Stephen Romay, asked me if he could review it. And I was like, no, of course you can't. It's a, it's a book about female sexual fantasy. He's like, yeah, but men need to know what they are, Caroline. <laughs> 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 so we can make them come true. And I was like, you cheeky devil, but I let him do it. But one of the chapters was that erasure of the line or that blurring of the line be between consent and its opposite. Uh, one whole chapter of the book, and the book is thick, is filled with uh, fantasies of women you know, in bikey sheds and being held down and being blindfolded. It's really interesting. Like, that definitely formed a solid part of the book. Well, consent, um, legislation around consent is one of the biggest changes that we have seen in the past um, uh, decade, I suppose, in, in, in law. 
uh, all jurisdictions in Australia now have affirmative consent laws uh, which require you know, enthusiastic ongoing participation to sex. I'm not sure how this the whole night became about sex, sorry. About <laughs> <that>. <laughs> um, but Janet, what's your take on that, um, that perhaps consequence or corollary to the Me Too movement and, and the way it is shaking out through the law? Um, I, it was probably an in inevitable part of the Me Too movement uh, in, in the sense that uh, we believe all women necessarily meant that the moment that a woman had raised an allegation of sexual assault, we had, we had to believe that woman. Um, so, therefore, you had to have um, this thing called affirmative um, consent, which means basically at every stage of sex you are giving consent. I've never really worked out how in practice it operates. Mm. I, I, I genuinely believe it's one of these theoretical things that in practice, how do you decide that there is uh, enthusiastic consent the whole way through? Um, I don't want this to be about sex either. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is troublesome and I think we will see more and more cases yeah. uh, which expose that something that sounds okay to, a, uh, to, to the Me Too movement, maybe when it's applied in a court of law, um, when you have to actually produce evidence, is, is much harder. What do you think about that, Ellie? You've grown up in a generation who are much more comfortable talking about this kind of issue than, than you know, my generation was. Not that apparently anyone else is uncomfortable talking <laughs> about it. But, uh, um, you know, the, the, I imagine consent would have formed part of the conversation, um, you know, uh, th when you were first learning about these issues. Oh, of course. And yeah. so how, what are you, what's your take on the kind of agitation that some in society have felt about those laws? I think that consent's incredibly important and I think that seeking seeking consent is an incredibly important thing that needs to be done and I think that if that means that you have to say, you know, I consent to this, then that's the way that it should be. Um, I had an argument with um, somebody recently, uh, he, he was about, oh gosh, 65 or so, about whether or not um, saying I need to take a break um, is a withdrawal of consent or not. Um, those are the sort of questions that the courts are coming up against, um, is, is what does that affirmative consent look like and, and um, what does a withdrawal of consent look like if, if you're consenting at the beginning but then you stop midway through, what does that look like? And honestly, it's, it is one of the greyest areas of law that we've got and I think that we've got a long way to go before. And I, I, don't, I don't think anyone really knows what the solution is to ensure that um, women are safe in their... Well, predominantly women are safe in their sexual encounters but also to ensure that... Um, men aren't, you know, being put in prison for, for a crime that they uh, either didn't realise that they were committing or, or didn't commit at all. One thing that doesn't change in, in, in many of these cases is that it comes down to a he said, she said yeah. situation. So unless you have it in writing, um, you can claim that you, you got consent or you can claim that you gave consent. Um, and, and that part of the sexual assault equation doesn't change and that's what has always made sexual assault so, so, so fraught. Well, one of the most detailed examinations of consent that uh, you know I, I've seen, and I'm sure many of you watched it too, was Justice Michael Lee's um, granular examination of what happened between Brittany Higgins and Bruce Lehrman on that night in uh, 2019 when she says uh, she went back to Parliament House with him um, thinking that they were going to be collecting some documents or maybe collecting his keys... He said they went back to work on some French submarine documents. Justice Michael Lee found that, in fact, uh, um, whatever they went there for, and they probably went there um, um, not, not intending to look at French submarine documents, uh, that she did not consent to what ultimately happened. That mm. was Justice Michael Lee's finding. Um, Janet, that was in the middle of an epic judgment that um, we all kind of were digesting very quickly. What was your take on the way Justice Michael Lee worked his way through that reasoning in the defamation matter? Um, I thought m mostly it was it was it was a very good judgment, and he put a uh, a great deal of work into it. And it was the first time really that a you know a, a judge had gone through and, and looked at this because, of course, Bruce Lerman's uh, criminal trial was aborted. Um, so we never we we never had a resolution to this. But remember, this is not a criminal resolution. It's in a defamation case. It's on the balance of probabilities. Um, and Michael Lee went through the facts forensically. And that was always a risk for Bruce Lerman that that would be the finding. You know, from, from, the, the, from the moment that this case started, I was never, and I don't want this to sound callous, 
But I was never terribly interested in what happened that night. I was interested in whether it, there could be a fair trial. And I think the moment that it became trial by media, trial by parliament, trial by just about every institution in this country that coalesced against the presumption of innocence, including a prime minister at the time who got up in parliament and said that he was apologising for things that had happened that night uh, and subsequent to that night, it was impossible to have a fair trial. Mm. It wasn't just unfair to a defendant who had been charged and not yet heard in a court of law, but it was terribly unfair to two women who were at the centre of that, and that was, of course, on the, uh, the other allegation, which became, as Michael Lee said, the major motif, which was the political cover-up allegation. There were two women at the centre of that who had been accused of a horrendous act of covering up a rape. Um, and I, I think at The Australian we have done such a tremendous job of making sure that we have covered this case from just about every angle that we could because it seemed to us that much of the media were not interested in hearing from other women in this case, that Believe All Women only ap applied to Brittany Higgins, that when Linda Reynolds claimed that she, uh, that she in fact did everything that she thought she could to support... Brittany Higgins in the days after, um, and when Fiona Brown said the same thing, they weren't given as much credibility. And I think that was really, really sad to watch. Um, and certainly the other part of Michael Lee's judgment that I found uh, particularly riveting, um, because there was literally no evidence to support an allegation of a political cover-up, and he finally put that to bed. Mm. And we had been waiting a long, long time for that to happen. Ellie, now we're seeing another defamation matter spinning out of this, uh, this you know, story which has uh, grown so many heads. It's quite remarkable and it's, it ended quite a few careers along the way, mm. <laughs> by the way. Um, the defamation case is, of course, Senator Linda Reynolds suing Brittany Higgins and in a separate proceeding her husband David Shiraz over tweets that they made, which she says implied, imputed, that she did not care for Brittany Higgins' welfare and, and um, that the conspiracy was true. Mm. What's been your sense of, of you know, the, you know the, the, the point of defamation action? You know, is it worth it? Is it worth suing for defamation? <laughs> it's it's life-ruining. It's absolutely life-ruining. As, as, you know, Justice Michael Lee said, um, Bruce Lerman went back for his hat, went back into the lion's den for his hat and, and you know, got... Uh, that was a terrible result for him. Um, we know that Linda Reynolds has, has put up her house, um, you know, as, as part of all of this. Um, it's, it's a terrible situation that bankrupts people um, all in, in search of a vindication of a reputation. So, uh, look, if you're certain that you're going to win, by all means, but I think that um, we've had an explosion of defamation cases um, uh, over the past few years, um, and I think that this is just the latest of them that is, is probably going to be incredibly damaging um, to, to many parties involved. Like me, you followed that case very closely, the one that's happening in Perth, although you weren't in court reporting it every day. Do you have a sense of, uh, of which way it's going to go? <laughs> oh, gosh, I wouldn't be silly enough to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I might get a fight. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I think that they, they probably put up both uh, quite compelling cases and uh, Justice Tottle will hand down his judgment uh, in due course. Um, <laughs> 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 I'll try one more time. <laughs> um, Caroline, Brittany Higgins didn't give evidence in that matter. She didn't go to court to, to give evidence. Um, her lawyers submitted to the judge uh, some evidence th that was sealed that we couldn't see uh, um, that they said indicated that she had some serious, serious health concerns. Of course, we know that she's pregnant um, and I think at, at least some of the time is in France now. What's your sense of, um, of that decision and how that might influence the way people think about that matter and, and that case? You know, she's obviously got some... Um, she's, she, she is a, a, a compelling storyteller. She has what Justice Lee found to be a compelling story. Do you think it was a mistake for her not to, not to give evidence? I, I'm a little old-fashioned, so I would say that the health of the baby comes first. And if she feels like she can't um, testify because she is pregnant um, and obviously a vulnerable witness as well, then she's made the right uh, decision for her baby and that is, uh, and therefore for herself. Um, I would disagree with two things here. The first, I would dis the first thing I would disagree about is whether or not there could have been a fair trial because I, I did cover criminal cases for a very long time and I understand that some, some of these cases are civil, but I believe very much in the jury system 
and I have seen juries go into courtrooms where the um, accused is very well known. An example of that would be Ivan Milat. Mm. Um, and also I covered a case um, in Queensland where the murdered child was David, uh, sorry, Daniel Morecambe, um, and that was a case that everybody in Queensland knew everything about. And yet, um, when you sit uh, 12 members of the Australian public down, they are such good people by and large. And you as a judge can say to them, I want you to forget everything you have heard up until now. The, the responsibility on your shoulders is solemn and serious. And I want you to listen only to me and only to the evidence that you hear in this courtroom and you come to your decision honestly. And if people say to you afterwards, well, you got it wrong, obviously he did it or she did it or he didn't rape her or she did or whatever, then you can honestly say from the, from the good position in which you sit, I sat in the room. I listened to the evidence, I heard both sides, and I made my decision. And I think we can trust them. I think we can trust Australians in that way. The other thing I would slightly disagree with is the idea that, um, you know, uh, de defamation law, it has become such a monstrous and chilling beast in Australia. It must become easier for us to be able to talk openly amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. It must become easier for us to be able to challenge each other on various ideas. It has become so difficult to say so many things that people would like to be able to say in good faith. Mm -hmm. Just have a different opinion. Mm -hmm. Just challenge someone else's idea. And you're right. People keep running to the courts and everybody gets sued and, and it costs a fortune and lives are destroyed. And I think that that is not who we are as Australians. Mm. We have always been a little robust. We've always <laughs> had a good sense of humour. We've always been prepared to listen to our neighbours and we're losing that mm. because defamation has become Boy, Pat so Boy, Pat O'Shane had no sense of humour. The first piece yeah. I ever wrote for the Sydney Morning Herald like <laughs> 22 years ago um, was about a magistrate in New South Wales, Pat O'Shane, and she sued for defamation. And I thought, <laughs> well, OK, well, my law degree's over. I was about to start this new career in journalism. <laughs> That's over. <laughs> anyway, that case went all the way to the High Court and that was, that was quite traumatic. It's true, <laughs> it is. It's traumatic. It isn't? Is. I mean, you're a robust person. Person and, you, and you're highly intelligent. But for, for an ordinary person, and we've seen it in the community who's faced with a defamation case because of something they said on Facebook about their local cake sale, mm. it's terrifying. Mm, they mm, lose mm. their house. They don't have um, the backing of company lawyers. They don't have um, the, the defences that we have available to us as journalists. And we still lose, mm, as mm, you know, mm, we still mm. lose. And I, I think that's, that's one of the more awful mm. things um, it would be wonderful to see some law reform in that regard. Mm. Let me say thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being members of the Australian Plus. Um, and don't forget to listen to The Front tomorrow morning, wherever you get your podcasts, and you'll hear this conversation all over again. Please join me in thanking these amazing panellists. Thank you.